Hello Warfighters, War is Hell. Welcome to the next episode of the military lecture series I'm doing as part of my university research. Today we're going to be looking at how the Soviet military strategy was developed. Before we get started though, I do want to thank everybody who's helping support me throughout this entire project, whether you're hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, or if you're donating financially, that really helps out a lot. If you're looking to help donate, this type of money goes to help uh, fund my education through textbooks, tuition, and finding other opportunities for me to do some research, which I will, of course, share with you on this channel. We're going to be posting this about every single Monday and Friday, so there should be content coming out regularly, and your money helps uh, allow me to do this. A lot of what we're going to be seeing today comes out of the book Soviet Military Strategy in Europe by Joseph D. Douglas Jr. It is a great book, and if you want to get your hands on it, there is a link in the description below on where you can get that at Amazon. Now, let's go ahead and get to it. And the first thing we're going to look at here is what was Soviet military science and how they emphasized this as a very uh, integral part of their military affairs. Because the Soviet Union really treated military science as an actual science. There were different theories that they would interpret and test, different ideas that were shared with one another, and different methods uh, of studying these various things. They would look at issues and try to come up with resolutions to these. They would ask questions, find contradictions, and, and find out uh, solutions to various problems that they were seeing with these things that they were discovering. For example, here's some of the things that they were able to analyze over the years. In the 50s, they revised their doctrine to include the use of nuclear weapons as those became more and more prominent in the early 50s. In the 60s, they reviewed their centralized command structure and analyzed, does this need to be centralized or should it be decentralized? They looked at the role of tanks, troop concentrations, dispersal requirements during nu uh, nuclear war. These discussions, uh, from what we were able to find, were very structured. Uh, in and how they were able to have them and there's some contradictory information we've been able to find about exactly how open these were which makes sense the Soviet Union is not necessarily known for being an open and free society but one could surmise that at the very top levels of the government when they're working amongst themselves there may be a lot more opportunities to be open than you would find elsewhere so I wasn't able to find exactly how free these debates were, but I can imagine there was definitely a level of freedom here that may not have been seen in other areas of the military as far as analysis and providing opinions. Now, the Soviet Union defined their military science as the unified system of knowledge on the preparation and conduct of armed conflict in the interest of the defense of the Soviet Union and other socialist countries against imperialist aggression. And this fits very well with what we learned in the last episode about the offensive nature of the Soviet Union against uh, capitalism. Now, here is some different functions that Soviet military science would include. And this is a very, very broad uh, set of functions that you're going to find right here because this was a very core component on how the Soviet Union would develop their doctrine, their strategy, and many other aspects of their military. The military science of the Soviet Union looked at the past, present, and future. However, what we would find out later is that there are different areas of focus within the Soviet military science, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that were focused on more things like the present and immediate future. But the military science as a whole tried to be all-encompassing, trying to learn lessons from the past to incorporate it into what they were experiencing at the current time and to maybe use lessons from the past in the future too. Now, the military science was broken down into various categories and specialization. We see something like this very similar in some of the other sciences. Take, for example, chemistry. You have organic chemistry, you have biochemistry, and it goes on uh, past that here. Here's where some of the area, or here is some of the areas uh, that the armed services and the Soviet Union would see as various categories of specialization. Uh, specialization. There was general theory theory of war or military art, theory of training of, and education, military historical science, military administration, military geography, and military technical sciences. All of these are very important to understanding how the Soviet Union functioned, but the most important one, and the one that we're gonna focus on here uh, quite a bit throughout this series, is the theory of war of, and military art. Now, this is where a lot of the tactics would be determined and a lot of the how would we go about accomplishing this scenario was really developed. The scope of this is as follows. 
They're supposed to take a look at the laws governing armed conflict, which are inherent in strategy, the conditions and nature of a future war, the theoretical foundation for preparation of the country and of the armed forces, and the principles of military planning, uh, the services of the armed forces and the basis of their strategic utilization, the fundamentals of civil defense, the methods of conducting armed conflict, the basis of the material and technical support for armed conflict, the basis of leadership of armed of military forces and of the war in general, and finally, the strategic attitudes and capabilities of probable opponents. Now, this might have been a lot easier for the Soviet Union to do this last one than... Uh, the West might have done towards the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was very closed off and it wasn't easy to gather some of this information. Uh, but this was a big part of the Soviet Union was trying to forecast what these attitudes, capabilities, and, and what their potential adversaries, of course, we know this being the United States and, and NATO would do. Again, a lot of what we're going to be seeing kind of focuses on, on this uh, particular point right here. What do they perceive that NATO and the United States was going to do? And what would they in turn do to counter those things? So I'll be really excited to kind of learn more about this last one here, the strategic attitudes and capabilities of probable opponents. Another reason is because I'm trying to do the same thing here with my study to try and understand their thinking and uh, what brought them to some of these conclusions to understand their military organization a lot better. Now for Soviet military science, this was primarily uh, put together here by high ranking officers. They were the ones who wrote most of the textbooks uh, and the Soviet armed forces really saw this as their job to develop a single military strategy which all the services were required to adhere to. Uh, for the high ranking officers, this was almost seen as their largest and, and most important function to some degree, to be able to pass off the things that they had learned to the next generation, to be able to develop these things based off of their own experience. Now that does call into question, and, and this is I think a research project of its own, to see how effective though that was. Because a lot of these Soviet officers may have been, let's say for example, uh, really been in World War II, and that's where they gained a lot of their experience. How much of that were they taking to the present day? You know, this book is written in 1980, so how much of that was brought into the 1980s and may not have been applicable to that particular time? How effective was this strategy? I think it's something that would be really, really great to analyze. But there were three categories of focus for the Soviet sciences. The first of which here, and we do have to make sure that as we go through this, and I should clarify this now, is some of the terminology here is going to be different than what we may find in the West. And I think it's important to understand how the terminology is different. And so we're going to go into some detail here for these three categories before we kind of wrap this up to let you guys know what some of these differences are and kind of lay this out because these terminal or these terms are going to be used later on in some future videos so i think it is important to kind of uh, lay this out here the first of which is uh soviet military doctrine now where it gets different here is the u.s army has its own doctrine there's a u.s naval doctrine i mean all these different branches within the united states have their own doctrine but for the doctrine of the Soviet Union, this is similar to the U.S. national security policy. It was all encompassing. And we get a good idea of what their um, military doctrine was supposed to be from the officer's handbook of the Soviet Union that was uh, translated into English, of course. So this is what they say about their military doctrine. They say, Military doctrine is a system of guiding views and principles of a state on the character of war under given specific historical conditions. The, de the determination of the military tasks of a state, the armed forces, and the principles of their construction, and also the methods and forms of the solution of all these tasks, including armed conflict, which issue from the goals of the war and the socio-economic and military technical capabilities of a country. Now again, this is drawn up by some of their most high-ranking political party and military officials. And if we again refer to the Soviet officer's handbook, we can find out what their doctrine was. It was, Soviet military doctrine has an offensive character. The Soviet Union will conduct the war which the enemies impose on them in the most offensive manner in order to attain the smashing of the enemy in short times. It goes on to say that the Leninist ideas of the decisive role of the offensive in armed conflict find reflection in Soviet military doctrine. 
which considers the offensive as the basic type of combat action of troops. Only a decisive offensive conducted at, at high rates and at a great depth achieves the complete smashing of the enemy in short times and the seizure of important areas, objectives, and political and economic centers. We'll be able to see later on as we focus on this a little bit more where nuclear weapons are involved in the Soviet line of thinking, but it does get very interesting because according to uh, the book, Soviet military strategy in Europe, the Soviets viewed nuclear warfare as a phase to which a, for, uh, a war would escalate to, not necessarily its own type of conflict. So therefore they plan not only to prepare for such a conflict that included nuclear weapons, but also how to endure through one, economically, politically, whatever it may be, whether it be a short war or a prolonged war. Now it was seen by some in the West that the Soviet Union would develop this all-encompassing military doctrine that was supposed to be uh, the core concept that everybody would uh, have to, to follow, this offensive strategy that we've been talking about here. Again, they didn't believe that they would necessarily adhere to the doctrine when war broke out. It's the same philosophy, of course, that your plan never survives first combat, uh, first contact with the enemy. But the author of the book, Joseph D. Douglas Jr., disagrees with this. He says the doctrine is a guide for the preparation of war. It is not a set of rules to follow after the outbreak of war. When war breaks out, strategy takes over. And that's what we're going to be talking about next is what was Soviet military strategy. This is probably the most important aspect of study uh, for us as we go through this series because it's what we're going to focus on for a majority of this particular presentation and series. Uh, this is where we see the development of, of individual services having their own ideas, tactics, and so forth. Otherwise known as operational art in the Soviet Union, what this does is it looks at some of the areas that would concern large areas of, or areas of large concentration of troops, such as like a front, uh, an army, or in some cases, even a division. Uh, this was determined primarily by the Soviet general staff on what these large formations were going to do. Tactics was for the smaller units like squads, companies, and battalions to really address what they would do uh, at a, a more smaller scale, like in a battle or an engagement, things like that. But of course, the, the tactics here were tied to the operational art, especially with larger units like regiments and divisions, because tactics is definitely used at that level as well from the Soviet strategy. Uh, each type of the armed forces had their own tactics, whether it be a motorized rifle division, an artillery division, armored divisions, engineers, anti-air, so forth. You know, all these different groups would have their own separate tactics. And this is where we really start to see, or this is really where the largest division of Soviet military strategy would take place. So what I've been able to do here is to include for you a, uh, a kind of shortened down or smaller version of a chart that is found in the book that kind of helps explain things like where does Soviet military strategy fit in, this operational art that we were talking about, and tactics. Where, where do these things uh, play a role in the overall structure of the Soviet military? And hopefully, this helps you understand how the strategy as a whole for the Soviet Union was really developed. I know I learned a lot from this. I hope you guys did as well. So make sure you like the video. If you did learn something, comment down below and tell me what you did learn out of this. Subscribe the uh, to the channel again every Monday and Friday, just about every Monday and Friday because real life happens, let's be honest. You'll be finding a video about uh, this particular topic. There's gonna be a lot of things that we're gonna be exploring in the future, so I'd love to have you there. We do have a Discord where you can join in on a the number of conversations that we have about this and also other topics as well. would love to have you be a part of that. And again, if you can help support me in the channel through Patreon or through a one-time donation, all of that is in the description below. I cannot thank you enough if you choose to do that. But thanks again for watching, you guys. War is hell. You don't have to worry because Warfighters got your six.